Hello and welcome to the Profitable Nomad Couple podcast. This is a show where we share all of our secrets about building a sustainable, location-independent lifestyle. We are Austin and Monica. We're a digital nomad couple here to help you develop an entrepreneurial mindset, ignite your passions, and develop a purpose-driven online business. Get ready for weekly insights and inspiring stories to empower you to live life on your own terms. So are you ready to unlock the nomad mindset and embrace a life of limitless possibilities? Let's dive in. All right, you guys, welcome back to another episode of the Profitable Nomad Couple podcast. We're super excited today because we are here with our friend, Elvie. Elvie started out as an Instagram friend, and now I feel like we just, even though we've never met in person, I just feel like we're real life friends now. <laughs> but Elvie, welcome to the show. Hi, Austin. Hi, Monica. Thank you very much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, we're super excited to have you here as well. Why don't you start out by telling our audience a little bit about yourself? So, well, my name is Alvira. I'm from Seville, the south of Spain, but I've been living in London now for 10 years. Yes, I miss the sun a lot. <laughs> um, I'm a coach, so I do help people redesign their professional life in a way that fits their life. The reason I do this is because I'm a dreamer. And I know this sounds a little bit weird, but I just honestly believe that we all can do anything that we set our minds to as long as we are willing to put in the effort. And that's how I ended up being a coach, because it's a way for me to empower people and to help them create the life they want. Well, a little fun fact about me is that I didn't eat vegetables until I was 25. And then one night, I decided to went vegan. And it just, from then on out, you just ate vegetables. Yes. So, well, my mom obviously tried to, she... Uh-huh. Made purees with the vegetables and all that stuff. But then growing up until I was 25, yeah, I avoid vegetables as much as possible. And then one day, series of things happening. And I went vegan from one day to the next. Wow. wow that's a big change like from that. like not eating any vegetables to all of a sudden being vegan, where that's like the majority of what you eat. Dang. How's that transition been? Amazing. But because obviously you have to redesign all your habits. But it's been amazing. So much energy. I advocate now for plant-based diets all the time. I know it's difficult, so I'm flexible occasionally when I have to be. But it's been amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. Is Jose doing that with you? Yes, he is. I basically, when I went vegan, I told him that there was not going to be any more meat in the house. If he wanted to eat meat, he would have to spread outside of the house. (laughs) And then he just decided to join me. Yeah, that's so awesome. It's funny because Austin's brother lived with us for a little bit in college and he didn't eat vegetables either. And so I was exactly like your mom. My favorite game was to figure out how many vegetables I can hide in his food without him knowing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like pure really small, so puree it. Like really small. I was like mixing it with like the ground beef for hamburgers, you know, like. I can't imagine what my mom has to go through <laughs> with me in vegetable spots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had fun with that personally. I thought it was a game. <laughs> I mean, if we had food that we didn't want him to eat, we would hide it underneath the vegetables in the fridge and he, he would, would never, never find, find it. it. <laughs> cool. Well, we are super excited to have you here to talk about career changes because that's what you really work with a lot of people on in your coaching. Is that right? Yes, I uh, do career change. I look at it from a holistic point of view. So I think our careers are really intertwined with our, with our lives. We cannot separate them. So I like to look at it from like a novel viewpoint of view. Yeah, I help people who are going or want to go through a career change. I love that because so often I hear people being like, oh, well, it's just a job. So I, I don't have to. You're not supposed to like your job. But then when we look at the math, we spend the majority of our adulthood at work. So you have to like your job. It has to fulfill you. It has to bring you joy. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're just wasting your time going to this dead end job that you're hating over and over and over again. And it really does bleed into every aspect of your life. Definitely, Monica. It's like I was reading the other day and we spent about 13 years or more working. It's unbelievable. And then you hear all the time people saying, oh, yeah, it's Friday again. And it's like, well, you're living your life for two days out of seven. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely insane. So when, when people come and start working with you, at what point are they at? Like, how do they know when they're ready to make a career change and come to you for help with it? Uh, well, it depends on the person. Obviously, there are different situations and every person is different. I think for me, uh, there are three aspects where that I think are really important for career change. One of them is confidence. I think you need to believe that you are able to do the change, right? So a lot of people come to me when they have confidence problems, they want to do a career change, but they don't feel like they can do it. The other one is people who doesn't know what they want to do, right? They know they don't want to do what they are doing at the moment, but they don't know what they want to do next. Within this, I think there are so many different things, right? Uh, it's about what you're passionate about, what your strengths are, what are your skills, what are your values as well. I think it's really important in here. Third one is people who know they want to do it, they want to make a change. They know what they want to do. They just don't know how to do it. So I call this like the preparedness stage. And it's about reflecting on what your current situation is and how can you make that change in a way that works for you. Right. So, for example, if you are in your 20s and living with your parents, your situation is completely different. Maybe you are able to just quit your job and focus full time on a career change. Whereas if you are living on your own, you have to pay rent and bills. You maybe don't have money saved or you don't want to spend that money that you have saved. Mm -hmm. You will need a completely different plan. So I think, see, I, I work with people who are in all different stages. Mm-hmm. So for the, the people who are in those first groups that you explained, can you explain for us a little bit about maybe what that would feel like for someone who needs to make a, re- a career change, but maybe can't articulate or hasn't identified that as the thing that needs to change in their life? What would that feel like? And how do you know that a career change could be something that would help you? The thing is about knowing what the end goal is. Maybe you don't know that what you need is a career change, but what you want is traveling, for example, something you guys can relate to, right? What you want is to travel. Your career is basically the thing that doesn't allow you to do that. So that can be one way that you know that's the change you need. I think another important thing is motivation. You need to know what are the reasons behind. So is it, for example, a lot of people quit their job because they are dissatisfied with the work environment. That doesn't mean that you need to change careers. Maybe you just need a different job in the same industry, for example. Another reason, for example, is work-life balance. But again, what does work-life balance mean to you, right? For some people, people who love their job, they probably don't mind to work 60 hours a week, mm-hmm. whereas other people just want to work 40 because there are other things that are more important. So I think exploring your end goal, exploring your motivation is really important and really crucial to know if what you need is a career change. Oh, I love that answer. That's so important. I think so often we forget to ask ourselves what we even want from our lives. And so just like taking that time to always be evaluating, is this job what I want? Is this taking me to my end goal? What is my end goal? And how do I know that everything in my life is lining up to get me to that end goal? Definitely. And I think sometimes, or maybe not everyone, but definitely a lot of people just follow the norm, right? We -hmm. have been told that success is or looks like X. And that's it. We're going, we're working towards that without ever stopping and thinking, is that really what success means to me? Mm -hmm. Because if not, what's the point to even making an effort to get there? Like, I've got this really funny story. This is how everything changed for me, right? And it started with Jose asking me a question one day. Like, I was in this room, super well planned. I was working towards, so I studied hospitality management. I wanted to become a director in a hotel. That was the plan. So I came to England. I started to work in a hotel. Uh, progress to supervise so everything was going really well but I just wasn't really happy and then that's when I started with Jose as well and one day 
I remember we were talking and I was saying that I wanted to be a director and that I wanted to be successful and that I wanted to have money. And he asked me, why is it that I wanted to have money? Like, I remember he told me, you are the least materialistic person I know. Why money is so important to you? And that hit me. That's when I think everything started there because I started to ask myself this question. Why is it that I'm, why am I looking after money? What are the reasons? What is it that is really important for me? Yeah, everything move on from there. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. I like that story. This actually goes along really well with something I was just having a conversation with some friends about last night about evaluating the why behind what you do. And I feel like for a lot of people, their initial reaction is, even if they're not like saying this out loud, uh, they go into a job for the paycheck, for how much money they make. Or the benefits. Or the benefits that it has. And I feel like sometimes people don't always take the time to take a step back, like we were just talking about, and to ask themselves, like, why am I here? And not just here at this job, but like, what's my purpose? Like, what am I working towards? What do I want my impact to be in this world? And I can almost guarantee that it's not going to be just about how much money you make. And sometimes that money that you make can be a means to an end. But your job, like, I agree with you. I feel like your job should be more than just that. So I love that you, when you do your coaching, you mentioned that you do it, you have like a, a more holistic point of view with it, because it is more than just one aspect of your life, you look at how it can influence and integrate with every other thing that you do in your life. So I like that a lot. So I feel like this is really easy for us to sit and talk about. But like, realistically, the people listening who are maybe like, wow, maybe I need a career change that can be such a hard pill to swallow that can be so daunting. So why is it that pivoting and making career changes, even though on paper, it might be the best decision for us? Why is that so hard for us to do? Oh, I love this question. Uh, I think I'm going to start this with a story. For me, it was a crazy story that I had created in my head, right? Like I had this story or this vision of who I wanted to become or who I wanted to be, the job I wanted to have. And not only it was my vision, but I somehow had created this expectation that I thought people had from me. Like I thought my mom wanted me to do this and I had to succeed on this. Otherwise I would let her down, which I obviously didn't want to do, right? This for me was the most difficult thing. It was telling my mom that after studying for four years, spending a lot of money, a lot of effort into getting where I was, I actually wanted to quit hospitality. And I was terrified. I told my mom and I remember she asked me, what is it that you want to do? And I said, well, I like writing. And her answer was, well, if you want to write, just write. Which it suddenly made me realize that those expectations and fears were just in my head. Like it wasn't true that I was failing her. Like she never felt that way. So I think expectations is a big thing. It's hard for us to realize because we become we believe those things, right? You think about it so often that you end up believing them. The other thing is there is this call, this term called enmeshment, which in a career context means that you identify with your job. This is particularly uh, common with the millennials. You identify, I don't know, for me, it was hospitality. For someone else can be someone who has a super important corporate job. They identify with that job. So when you when you are thinking about changing careers, you are threatening your identity, right? Mm -hmm. You're not only threatening a part of your life, you're threatening your whole identity, which makes it way harder. So I think there is part of this mindset. I think we are asked to choose a career in our 20s, which for me is crazy to assume that the career you choose in your 20s is the career you're going to have forever. It's right. like yeah. the person I am now uh -huh. is completely different to the person I was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, we have this assumption that people choose one career and stick to it, whereas in reality, statistics shows that people change careers between three and seven times in their life. That's amazing. Wow. That's a lot. So I think it's, that's, yeah. And the other thing is humans in general, we don't like change, right? We just want to stick with what we know, even if it's not perfect. 
So knowing this makes it easier because then you can confront change in a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you said so many good things there. Like I want to pick this apart a little bit more. The first one you said was like sunk cost fallacy. Just like this fact that, wow, I've invested so much into this to get me to where I am today. Like I do, do you find that people feel like they're a failure a lot of times when they're like, I didn't get to where I wanted. So then I have to pivot and change. Yes, I think that is that. I also think that when people talk about career change, they feel like you are starting from the beginning again. Yeah. When that's not true, right? All the things you've done up until that point is experience you have. You have those strengths, you have those skills. Like everything you learn, even if it's a completely different career, you can use in your new one. So it's not like you are starting from the beginning. It's not that you fell. It's just 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 pivoting to a different thing, right? So you're just moving. Yeah. It's not a thing. A career is not a straight line. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought that up. I feel like that's something that we don't always think about. There are transferable skills, sometimes hard skills, um, a lot of times soft skills. But I think that's a good point. Like there's a lot of things that you learn that maybe we don't identify that do carry over from one career Mm -hmm. to another, from one job to another. And sometimes it's just like what you learned about yourself, like your likes and dislikes are just as important things to learn through these processes as, you know, the actual skills that transfer. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's sometimes easier. I always ask the question of what it is that you don't like or you don't want, because I think it's easier to start there when you don't, when you're not sure. And the other thing about the skills is because everything is changing really, really fast at the moment in the work environment, well, everywhere, right? But in your in in the work environment in particular, I think those soft skills, which I don't think is the right term, that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> but this is what companies are looking for now, right? Yeah. The fact that you have empathy, that you can work in in a team that you can communicate properly. Those are all skills that we have that are more valuable now than maybe knowing how to use a software because probably in six months' time, that software... going to be outdated anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So how... Okay, I feel like there's a little bit of a discrepancy here because I totally get that. I'm like, yeah, this is what companies want. As a business owner myself, that's what I look for whenever we hire... Um, And I know that's what companies are looking for. But on paper, that's a lot harder to prove. So do you have any like tips for how you can like bring your compassion maybe as your your best foot forward, bring that to the table? I'm not not an expert on CVs, for example, or this kind of stuff. But for me, for all the things I read and my experience, I think it's about not only saying that you are able to do something, but you need to show it. So Everyone puts in their CV, like, well, I'm good at mm, working in a team, but no one gives an example. So when you put it, just tell a story, right? Say Mm -hmm. why you were good working in a team. What did you achieve working in a team that makes you really good? I love that. I think that's important. Yeah. It's a piece of advice. It's almost like leading with the human side of you first, besides the skill side. Definitely. The other thing that you mentioned, going back a little bit, that I really want to pick apart as to why this is so hard for us is you talked about us identifying as our job, which was so fascinating to me because when we, I mean, we as digital nomads are meeting new people all the time. And one of the first questions everyone asks us is, what do you do? Or who are you? Like, explain yourself. And the first thing we say is, this is the work that we do. Why Why is that? Why do we do that? I think... It's because back back to what we were talking before, you spend a third or half of your life working. So it's normal that you identify with it, right? Yeah. But I also think that we're just not used to talk about other areas of your life. Can you imagine, I'm trying to do this now. So when I'm going to events, when I meet new people, I try really hard to avoid that question. So instead of asking, what do you do? I ask questions like, oh, what are your hobbies? Or what are you passionate about? Because then you will get different answers. 
But I think we are not used to do these kind of things. Yeah, I know Austin and I have talked about that before. Like, we want to avoid this question, but why do we even ask? <laughs> I don't even know what to ask because this is what we've been so trained to do. And I, I feel like even before we picked a career and studied for it and got that career, like ever since we're little, that's so what we're asked. Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Instead of like, who do you want to be? Maybe is a better question. And then you're asking. in school and you and you ask, what are you studying? And then you graduate, get a job. And what do you do for work? Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So this post on Instagram a while back, I can't remember who it was, but she was talking about this. And she said, leave a comment and introduce yourself without saying what you have studied or what you do for work. Mm -hmm. It was super interesting because then if you avoid these answers, then you need to dig deeper, right? You need to talk yeah. about who you, who you are, who you want to become. And I think that's a more, much more interesting conversation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It is. It does bring up a, like a lot of different parts of who somebody is. But I would imagine that's challenging for a lot of people to answer because we are so used to that other question. It, I imagine it's challenging for people to answer. Like, oh, like, what am I passionate about? You know, well, it kind of takes away the safety blanket. Like all of a sudden you have to think like, who am I outside of work? Really? <laughs> you know, Yeah, but I think, well, someone has to start doing this right the same way. As you said, Monica, we've been trained to do this. Yeah. Well, someone has to train us to do something different. So yeah. why don't we start? Yeah. So along those same lines, do you have any advice for us about how we can separate ourselves, our identity from the work we do, or like how we can come forward with a more holistic perspective of who we are as people? I think a lot of it is what we already talk about. So instead of asking yourself what you want to do, ask yourself who you want to be and try to do this in all areas of your life, right? Even when we are at work, for example, every day at work, you will be confronted with situations that are good, good for you to stop and reflect on how did you react to those situations? And what were the reasons for you to react that way? Yeah. And then you start, you start unpacking all that sort of stuff. Like, for example, I love um, personality tests. I'm qualified in this, which is basically have like this for personality preference. And I think this is so interesting and something that you can use a lot at work, but you can also use a lot in your personal life. And you start unpacking who you are, what you like about you as well, because there are a lot of things I love about myself, but there are a lot of things that I don't. And we become really comfortable with saying oh well that's the way that's the way I am that's just the easy answer right mm -hmm. you can also say well this is how I am reacting at the moment how can I react in a different way that's really really powerful so now that we've kind of like gone through like why we should even consider career change maybe like why we should look at the holistic picture of who we are why it's so hard for us can you tell us, like, what even does a career coach do? Like, how can a career coach help people who are struggling with these exact thoughts that we've been wrestling with this episode? Coach helps by creating a space and creating an interrupted time for someone to think things through, to explore new ideas, new possibilities. As, we, as we've been talking about, right, we have a lot of assumptions and beliefs about ourselves, about our careers, our lives, that are difficult for us to confront by ourselves. Even our friends are not, like, it's really rare that you sit with a friend and that friend is going to start challenging your beliefs, right? Yeah. So this is what a coach does. It creates a safe space and it challenges you to question those assumptions and to explore things that you maybe haven't think about it before. I almost call it like hold up a mirror. Mm -hmm. It's like you're holding up a mirror and say, is this true or is this right the person that yeah. mm -hmm. you are, right? With those challenging questions. I think the other way it helps is well, coaches don't give advice, right? Because the, the, only, the best expert in your life is you, right? No one knows your situation as well as you do. And the other thing is that we are more accountable and also more motivated to do something when we are the person coming up 
with that action mm-hmm. or with that plan. So I think I always say that coaching has like two different parts. The first one is discovering and the second one is creating. So discovering is about exploring who you are, about reflecting on your situation and the coach kind of guiding you or opening up the possibility to see other a different perspective. And then creating is about creating a plan to move you forward. And again, the coach is the person who is going to guide you through that process to come up with a plan about what it is that you want to do, how are you going to do it, when are you going to do it, which will make you much more accountable. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that's that's how coaching in general helps and how it helps my clients as well. I like that. And I definitely see how having that outside perspective and especially someone who's maybe not a spouse, because I feel like having someone that's like really close to you and really personally invested in your career, I feel like that would be really challenging to have that person be your accountability partner, to be that outside voice guiding you because they're so in- emotionally invested in the whole thing as well. So having a third party, a, a coach who's outside of that altogether to give that outside perspective, to give that help and guidance I just see that as something that would be invaluable as you're trying to make this transition and make this big change. Yeah. It's also really difficult for your friends and your family because they know you, right? So they mm-hmm. have already a story made out about you. Right. They have their own assumptions and beliefs about you. So the coach is a new person who doesn't know you and who also doesn't hold any judgment or expectations. Yeah. Like for me, when I was trained to be a coach, we had to practice, right? So I asked some friends if they wanted coaching. And it was a lot harder to coach someone that you knew really well than to coach someone you didn't know. Mm-hmm. And again, you put yourself on that coach mindset and you do it, right? But I could I could feel it was a lot harder because they were my friends, right? Because I want them to succeed. I knew right. stuff about them that, yeah. or stories about them that I made up that were already there. So that's really important as well. That's why a coach is like a objective person. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. I think one of the most valuable things you said too about having a coach is just having someone to create the space and force you to think through what's happening because on your own beliefs, because so often life happens so fast and moves so fast that we don't even stop to realize if we are, you know, taking on the assumption that we're letting down our mom, like your story you shared, or if it's something totally made up, or if we are taking on this belief system like that, you know, from from your parents or from other people who have been telling you something instead of like taking the time to think about what you want and who you actually are. And so Having someone there to intentionally create that space for you is unbelievably powerful. We don't have the time. I don't know if you feel this way, but we don't have that much time to, or we don't take the time to actually think things through properly. Like I see this a lot in myself as well, right? Like suddenly you are presented with a decision you need to make and you make the decision in the moment. But again, it's just your judgment, right? So you... So your opinion, your reasons for doing it or not doing it are just yours. You don't mm-hmm. have no one to say, well, hold on. Mm-hmm. Is this true? Is this yeah. a real reason? Is this really what you want? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think it's important to have that. that. Yeah, yeah I, definitely. So when you work with people, um, if someone comes to you and you're working with them as a coach, do you have a like a time frame that you work like are you working with them for a couple months just through this transition like how what's the length of of time that you normally work with someone to work on this topic or this issue well it depends on where the client is and also what the client needs right so i've, I've worked with people for as short as two months and there are other people that i work with i've been work i've been working with this client for like almost a year now mm-hmm. Because it's also, you're always going through changes, right? Even if you change careers, there are still a lot of, when you are starting that new career, there will be a lot of things that you're going through. So Mm -hmm. maybe you decide to keep the coach just to, again, have this time and this space. Okay. So it could depend. Also, if someone comes to me and they are 
at the point of, I don't know, um, making their CVs or applying for jobs, mm -hmm. that obviously is a short-term plan rather than if you come to me when you don't even know what you want to do yet. Right, right, right. I like that. And I love that you you tailor what you're working on and you tailor your coaching to the person that you're working with. Yeah, definitely. I think it's important. Like, like I said, every person is different. Every mm -hmm. situation is absolutely different. You cannot use the same model for everyone right mm -hmm. yeah we don't all fit on the same criteria i guess totally i that i totally believe that like so much everything we do is is custom as well because there is no one size fits all answer for anything in life not even the pair of pants i buy <laughs> you know there is no one size fits all solution and there that's the easy sell a lot of times people want us to believe that that you take one path and then you'll get there and you'll be successful. But realistically, success looks different for everyone. And there is no one way to success. Like you have to find the way that's best for you. So I absolutely love that. That was like a little side tangent soapbox that I got on, I guess. But how can our listeners, like people listening to this were like, wow, I really need to talk to Elvira and I need to talk to her ASAP. How can they connect with you? My website, which is elvirapromero.com. I guess you would put it in the and description. I'm also on Instagram, LinkedIn, um, Facebook. I use it a little bit, a little bit less, to be honest. But yeah, any of those people can I check every day, so they can just send me a message or just connect with me in any way they want. Perfect. Yeah, and we will absolutely include that in the description below, so that people can reach out to you if they want to start working with you, or at least find, at the very least find out more about what you do and be following you so that when they're ready, they can reach out. Yeah. And if if I can just add one more thing that yeah, I think course. I would love to share is that, you know, we are always waiting to be ready, but you're never going to be 100% ready to do anything. Right? The only way you're going to be ready is by doing it. So I think we need to accept that the 100% ready doesn't exist. So if you're thinking about it, a career change or any type of change for that matter, but if you're thinking about a career change and you're thinking, oh, well, I'm not ready yet, better questions to ask are what needs to happen for you to feel ready? And also knowing that you will never be 100% ready, what percentage could you be happy with, right? Think about, like, I don't know, for me, it would be an 80%. I like to be prepared, right? So for me, it would be an 80. So what that 80% means to me, it means that I need to study something. It means that I need to do a strength assessment. It means that whatever that is, you need to be conscious of that. But I'm just really conscious of people saying, oh, I'm not ready because, well, you never be unless you actually jump and do it. And I see people around me all the time waiting for the right moment, for the right time. Well, I'm not ready. I need to have more money safe. I need to learn more. I need to wait until this happens. And it's like, hold on, just take a step back and think really about this. What, is, what ready even means, right? So I think this is an important message. That's a really, 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 really good message. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, thank you, Elvi. That Those were... I love that final piece of advice. And I'm really glad that you left us with that. And I'm really glad for everything that you've shared. You are a very wise person. And anyone who ends up working with you must be a very lucky client. And I really appreciate you coming on and joining us in this conversation and sharing everything that you know, everything that you have on this topic and being a part of this conversation with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate that. I love talking to you. And hopefully we just inspire more people, right? To create the life that they want. Yes, that's the goal. That's the goal. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Profitable Nomad Couple podcast. We appreciate you listening to us today. If you enjoyed this episode, share it on Instagram and be sure to tag us at Austin and Monica. Together, we can inspire others to embrace a location-independent lifestyle. And while you're there, we'd love to connect with you. So make sure you follow us for more tips and inspiration on living your dream location-independent lifestyle. Until next week, remember that you have the power to shape your own path. So stay curious, stay adventurous, and stay connected.